Cover. Very warm welcome to our show here at Access to Perspectives Conversations. Thank you, Joe. Happy to be here. So everyone, please meet Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, another Joe. So we have a Joe guest and a Joe host today in the show. Um, okay, that's enough of the jokes on that. <laughs> for today, but um, it's a real pleasure because um, you are a um, consultant and advisor um, coach for mostly, if I, if I got it right, for entrepreneurs and female entrepreneurs to market themselves, um, owners? Yes. yes, yeah, mainly business owners, not necessarily female, but um, owners of, of startups, of small and growing businesses, um, of business owners who really want to be able to present themselves in a way that feels authentic and unique. Great. So, and then um, those of you who have listened to our podcast show for a while, you might wonder, so what has, is, has that to do with research now? Um, and just to introduce the marketing aspects of research, some of you might be more aware than others. Um, any researcher has to market our research topics and also build a reputation as a researcher and expert in our field. And I've been um, lucky to have experience of working not only in, within academia, but also in the entrepreneurial world. And um, yeah, also with the kind of work I'm doing today. And as a researcher, I was scared of terms like marketing and sales and it feels like dodgy and trying to trick people into buying something they don't really need, where at the end of the day, it's really about making services accessible to the clients or to the stakeholders in the research context. So Joe, would you mind maybe, or would you, would you like to share some of your journey of what brought you into marketing? Like wh what kind of milestones did you pass, which, brought into the position that you're not holding in supporting business owners to market themselves? And what's your approach in that? Absolutely. OK, so first of all, I, I can absolutely understand how the research world may not love the term marketing. I don't love the term marketing. I kind of, as far as possible, I try to avoid it because it's not really how I see the things I do. I see it as communications. And I think the difference, yes, it might sound like, uh, you know, playing with words like jargon, but actually communications, it's a dialogue between you and somebody who's interested in the thing that you could offer that you could do for them. It's not marketing, which of course has all those connotations that you're trying to sell them a thing that they perhaps didn't want. So you're going to make terrible, big special offers. You're going to be cut price. It's going to be discounted. It's not that. It's just the act of raising awareness, of creating understanding of options that may be of interest to people. But to, to go back to answer your question, Joe, um, how did I get to be here? Well, my journey also started in academia in a small way, I guess, in that um, I'm an English literature graduate. And like, I, I'm going to generalize, like every English literature graduate, so my, the only career I want is with books. I'm going to go into publishing. And so after university, I moved to London with a view to getting a job in publishing. And it's, uh, it's not renowned for being the most highly paid profession. It's kind of something that you have to do for the love of it. You have to work for free in the beginning, all of these sorts of things. Mm. So I ended up getting a, um, an internship, a, a free, an unpaid role rather with Macmillan in their marketing and publicity department. So I was delighted, but also disappointed. I don't want to be in marketing and publicity. I want to be an editor. I want to be a real editor. But once I got into the marketing and publicity department, I realized that actually the opportunity to work creatively and to interpret, in fact, to use some of the skills I'd learned through my English literature degree mm -hmm. to you know, interpret what is within the book, what will people want to know about it, what is the big message, was almost greater, certainly at a junior level, in marketing and publicity than it would have been editorial. Anyway, that came to an end. I continued to look for marketing jobs in publishing, and then as there were none, widened my search marketing jobs altogether, and ended up finding a direct marketing job in a conference company in London, which was kind of the closest thing that marketing can be, I think, to uh, like a canning factory. There was just this process, you know, you do this, mm. you get the next project, you do the same thing, you get the next project, you do the same thing. And so I went back to plan A, started uh, looking again for work in publishing, and I was lucky to get a great role with a, a, a really vibrant small publishing company 
where I could really learn and grow and end up building a bit of a marketing department, being involved in all aspects of the business. And it was there where I first learned about the idea of a brand. And I went on a fantastic training workshop with a guy whose name, I think he was Mike, but Mike who I don't know. Otherwise I'd give him the credit. And he had this great analogy. Um, so he was talking about, it was around about the time when Volkswagen had taken over Skoda. Mm -hmm. Before the time that Volkswagen took over Skoda, Skoda was, you know, divided. It was a terrible car. Nobody wanted to drive a Skoda. And then suddenly Skodas are great. And he said, you know, what changed? Was it just the bodywork? Was it the marketing? No, it was the engine. You know, they put a Volkswagen engine into the Skoda and suddenly it's a good car. Mm. And it's the very same thing, the relationship, I think, between brand and marketing. And so good marketing communicates the essence of the brand, like the engine, the thing that powers it. Mm. And so since then, I've kind of dedicated my career, really, to trying to help people find and correctly identify that engine and then to communicate it to other people in order that the people that they're connecting with aren't poor individuals who are being forced to buy a thing they didn't want, but the people who think, yes, I want exactly that thing that's inside, give it to me. And so that kind of transformed my, uh, my vision of marketing and what it's all about. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, for me, it was also like to understand the, mar the term marketing for yeah, what it's meant to communicate in itself. And um, so when you say the, the heart of somebody's services or when it's not Volkswagen engine, but the surrounding would still be Skoda, um, so how do, does that translate now to your clients, to a business owner? Does it mean like, is it other appearance versus in a value or rather finding a way to package the services um, in a way to identify what the client really needs and wants and finding the right narrative for the business owner to, yeah, to meet the demand in the market basically. And, What's the transitional? Okay, maybe this is basically asking for your USP. But what's the transitional, um, yeah, effort that clients uh, achieve by working with you in better sure. understanding their own products? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, the people who I really love working with are people who believe they're offering something that is good. You know, they believe they're doing something that will make a difference. That is purposeful. That in some way improves what their clients could otherwise access. You know, it's a good option. I think that should and would probably be true for most, if not all business owners, until they're being forced into making more and more profit just for, yeah, for whatever reasons. And there's a parallel also in the academic work, but we can get to that. Absolutely. No, I, th I think there should be a parallel there with, with academic work because it's creating a thing that you believe is purposeful and valuable. Mm. But it can be very difficult, almost, almost in a kind of direct proportion. The more that you are doing the thing for uh, you know, what feels like a, what's the word? Like a, 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 almost a philanthropic reason, you're doing the thing for the greater good. It can feel more and more difficult to apply an old fashioned concept of marketing to that thing that you're doing. Mm. Because it feels uncomfortable, the things don't match. You know, I'm doing something for good that's gonna help people or that's gonna progress academic thinking in the case of research, or it's going to advance science. So I don't want to be selling that thing. You know, I want, I want people to come and to want it for the right reasons. Um, mm -hmm. I want people to appreciate the value of the thing. And so this is effectively how I help people. I help people to translate their own understanding of the value of that thing into terms that the people they're talking to can understand. And so that, that requires generally there are three big parts to this. There's first of all, being really clear in yourself about what it is that you most want to achieve. And that can be quite hard to know at times as well. It can be quite hard to tease this out because when you're in the depths of the doing, you can get dragged in all sorts of different directions. You can end up thinking, oh, you know, I, I serve dozens of different people. I'm doing this for lots of different reasons. And so it can be quite hard to just find a space of calm and think, what actually, what is fulfilling to me? You know, for me, what is the importance of this thing? So this is like the first base you know because this is these are your fundamental beliefs the things that keep you going and doing the thing that you're going to do and that keep you coming back every day and feeling enthused about it then there's understanding okay who is it for and so really getting yourself into the head and the mindset of 
the person that you would wish to engage with your thing. And so trying to think, well, what's it like in their lives? Because you know, nine times out of 10, your perspective uh, customer or stakeholder in the case of academia isn't sitting in their home thinking, gosh, I really wish I could get a, such and such a thing today. You know, they're not just waiting for you to turn up and offer them the thing. They're dealing with a different problem. And so what's super important is to think, well, what is it like in the mindset of that person? What problem are they trying to solve? And what is preventing them from engaging with me? Is it that they're already engaging with somebody else? Is it that they don't fully understand what I do or what I, how I could help them? Is it that they don't fully understand their own problem and they need some more education around that first? You know, what actually is it? Is it that the thing's too expensive? Is it, you know, what, what is the barrier? And so the more closely you can understand the problem you can solve for them and the barriers that prevent them from engaging with you, that will help you to, to, to match up, let's say, to, to break down the barriers between what you wanted to achieve and what they were doing in their regular life. Now, the third part, the big third piece is what else is out there? So in some sectors, you would call this you know, competition. In the academic world, I, I can appreciate that it's not, well, and yes, I suppose it is competition, even if there is collaboration, it's a sense Could that be, other yeah. options. Like, other I feel it's collaboration very often is seen or yeah, lived as competition, unfortunately. Well, it depends. Both. But it's other options. It's things that the person who you would like to engage with you could engage with instead, rather than as well, but instead. Mm. So it's understanding what are those other options and how do they look to the potential mm. stakeholder in order that you can see, right, well, Everybody out there is proposing points A, B, C, and D, but nobody is talking about X, Y, Z, which is also important to me. So if I talk about X, Y, Z, I'm going to be different, I'm going to be relevant, and I'm solving my stakeholders' problem. And so these kind of three pieces are the, the critical basis, I suppose, from which I would then look to develop a person or a business's unique brand, their unique proposition that makes them different in a way that's relevant. Yeah, and ex yeah, and again, I, like I feel, well, it's not only a feeling, but there's proof of concept that researchers need to gain and develop their skills, their marketing skills, for lack of better words, or communication skills. There's a term like science communication, which is everything and everything, <laughs> like not nothing, which encompasses communicating with other researchers, with citizens, with stakeholders. So that's highly confusing and a whole lot of work. But if it's being looked at through those three um, categories or step, stepping stones that you just outlined, it's really a matter of, yeah, just, just getting clear on what our research topic is, who's, who's on the team, who's, who, who benefits from what we're working on, who are the stakeholders, and then finding a way to communicating that on a website, on a departmental kind of yeah, presence on, online. And hopefully also by the team to engage in communication through social media um, for, the, for the reason of getting out there and possibly, and also there's proof of concept for that, by doing that, there's a lot of opportunity to gain insights for our own research, to collect feedback before a research article is being published, because that might take months and years, um, and often exceeds the duration of a PhD program. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot. So like in these, you know, by, by just summarizing this in, in these three steps, it's it's really the essence of what science communication can and should be all about and how proven marketing strategies can serve also researchers in getting, gaining clarity about the research scope and finding ways to engage with the stakeholders. Yeah, I think it can also be important to think in terms of, in the same way that with a business, every business owner or founder kind of, they face a choice where you can think, Either the brand is mainly me and I'm going to lend some of that brand to my business to make my business thrive, or you're thinking I'm going to build a business brand and I'm going to make myself a little part of that. And I guess the same thing applies with research that's either I am going to be the brand 
people are going to be interested in my research because it is mine, or this research topic is bigger than me, I'm going to really build this research topic and I'm going to make myself a, a cog in that bigger wheel. Mm. And it's a choice that it depends on, on what you're doing, on what your ultimate ambition is, on your personality, on you know, your, your worldview effectively. It's not a right and wrong choice, but it's a useful choice to make because otherwise you can end up in a lot of confusion. And I think one of the difficulties you can, that can also come about, I see often with business owners, I can see it would also apply to researchers, is that if you do see yourself as more of an introverted type of person, it's not comfortable to accept that you are the brand. And yet sometimes it can be true. And so when that's the case, it can be helpful to mm. think about, well, to go back into that process I spoke about earlier and think about you know, what is your purpose in getting the thing out there? Because when you are the brand, that doesn't mean that you have to, you have to become a, a kind of classic celebrity and publish every part of your life. It means you are selecting the values that are critical to you in your professional capacity, that are the things that are going to become the basis for your personal brand. And by all means, you can still keep your personal self to yourself as privately as you like. Mm -hmm. It's just separating out which part of your personality is your personal brand or which part of your being is your personal brand and which part is just you quietly being yourself doing what you do. But it's interesting that you mentioned values because they are intrinsic to what's now known as open science movement, some people call it. Some people deny the term movement because anyway, so there's currently a trend towards open science, which basically, in my understanding and interpretation is just coming back to terms with good scientific practices in the digitalized world. And it's very much virtues and values driven. And what we I think can also see in the entrepreneurial world and the business world and industry is that more and more companies and corporates are redefining their activities and products around values, which, as we said earlier, should be the starting point for any business really to, to embrace. But I think there's a hunger in the Western societies to, yeah, to, to back to values and purpose-driven product design and solving the issues that we all face and back to community and instead of like, yeah, um, unlimited growth for uh, for the sake of it. Um, as much as this might sound cheesy and idealistic, but then again, like to me, it's, it's really the, the foundation of any activity as a researcher and or an entrepreneur or business owner. So from your experience with the clients that you work with, would they always mention their values as sometimes experience that as a hindrance to be able to function as a business owner out there or like with a need and a desire to, to be able to incorporate their values better? Because this is in part what I think I heard from what you just said, but if we could just elaborate a little bit more about what role does values, personal values play into designing a product and a business um, yeah, for small business owners? Mm -hmm. I think I've never known a setting where somebody's values would impede them from going out there with a business. I think that pretty much always the, the foundation that you can build from because you've, you've got, uh, you've certainly got your personality in the sense that, you know, if you see yourself as being somebody who doesn't really like to, to speak up, that can be quite difficult. Mm. But that's, that, that's where it can be very helpful to go back to your values and think, well, you know, I believe in helping people in this particular way. I believe in, um, I don't know, in a partnership and transparent communication. I believe in uh, innovation. I believe in you know, whatever. These are the values that guide you and that it's therefore useful to share as part of your communications mm -hmm. in order to attract other people who share the same values. So that when you do work with them, you're going to have a more satisfactory working relationship because you're coming at it from the same base, from the same expectation of what's important. Mm. And so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that you don't necessarily need to go out there and say, these are my five values. Your five values or your six values, whatever the values that kind of guide your business. And I tend to find that either there tend to be five or six guiding mm. values in a, in a business that's sort of quite typical. Um, these are the things that influence the way that you behave. And so what I always say is that 
choosing or identifying your values isn't just a question of picking stuff out of the air. You know, I like the sound of being adventurous. I like the sound of being innovative. Whenever somebody names a value that they say they have in their business, my first kind of uh, response is to challenge them to evidence it. And so, okay, adventure is important to you. Mm. Show me, how does that come across in your business? How, how can I see that in your business? And if I can't see that in your business, then I think you need to change the way you're doing your business mm-hmm. or you need to think again about what are the values that drive your business. And so it has to be stuff that we can see that are guiding, you know, if you say listening is a value, then how do you show that you are more listening than average, that you are um, making a bigger effort than just the ordinary man in the street? So I think it's important. That these are things that define the way that you live. Yeah. As a business yeah, person. That's brilliant that you said that. Also, I just want to um, clarify. I didn't mean, like, I think we all often unknowingly set out with firm values to start a business or to embrace a research topic. And then like in academia, what I've observed in myself being a PhD student is that our values are often compromised for the system that we find ourselves in. I mean, as business owners, we actually have the power to design a working environment, but then there's, I think the limiting factor is time and energy capacity and mindset, um, sure. which, which might impede then with our values. Um, so in that sense, and also what you just said, like I've also only 10 years into being on the market, um, identified the values that really work with me and that I brought to life over the years, because now I have the proof of concept and these are not just empty terms, but I can actually prove that this is, these are the values that I live and work by, which yeah. guide my activities and my services. Um, and also have a return of, um, yeah, of outcome for the people that I work with. So, so yeah, I think so. Would you agree that it's often not easy to to name the specific values that are important to us? Other than, I mean, we can easily buy into things like transparency, collaboration. These are all fancy and nice and easy words to comply with, but then in practice like it's a whole other thing to to work through and often <laughs> painful and I, I think many of these words in action demand a high a very high level of empathy of humbleness of you know stepping back and then trying to approach again so i think there's reason for them being coined values because they're not as easy to live as they are to, to be named just i think you're right and i think it's important to be honest in your choice of the values that you choose for your business and i so two things firstly you say it's taking 10 years to get clear about what exactly your values and to really own them and i think that's very very normal and to be honest that's kind of often where my services help because an outsider Mm -hmm. can often see more clearly you know right you're doing this this and this you're not doing this this and this you're coming across in this way and help to find a greater amount of clarity than is easy to find when you're trying to be introspective and looking into your own head. You you can be as uh, self-aware as you like, but it's often quite hard to find that rigor when you're looking at yourself, Mm -hmm. I think. The other thing is that, yes, exactly as you say, sometimes it is it is very desirable to choose a certain value. And I have an example of this is somebody I was working with lately who had sustainability as one of their values because it was important to that person. Mm. But in fact, in the way they were able to run their business at that particular time, in terms of the sourcing uh, agreement arrangements they're able to afford, in terms of the scenarios they're able to to work within, it wasn't really... They, they couldn't really evidence being more sustainable than the next person, you know, and so it's perhaps a value to aspire to, mm. but it wasn't perhaps a value that they could build on very solidly. It was perhaps more important at that point to identify other values that they were genuinely able to live right there and then and say that, you know, this is an aspiration for us. You know, of course, we're, we're motivated, perhaps we're forward looking, perhaps we're, um, we're innovative, you know, that all of the things that will lead towards that commitment to sustainability, which at the moment was economically just not really support- supportable through no fault of theirs, you know, as a, a business phase. 
Ja. Ja, and I acknowledge also that like sustainability is, is urgent for all of us to embrace and live as soon as possible if we're not already there. But as you said, like to, to name the value and being honest about like we're not there yet, but we're very much trying really hard to get there. And if you have any ideas how we can do better, please let us know. Kind of to, to be just open, yeah. vulnerable, and transparent about what values are actually important to you. Just don't see how you can incorporate and implement them right right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in that instance, you know, your value perhaps would be that you are um the idea of an open dialogue or the idea of always improving you know these could be the values that you're living in right in that very moment and maybe also listing the little things that are already in place like you know sure. just, you know buying fair trade organic coffee <laughs> for the office and and sharing that with the customers even yeah. though it's highly unrelated to the actual services that are on offer but <laughs> They are part of the package because of the values that carry the, the business as a whole. No, that's true. It's making choices, isn't it, that, that make your values more true, if that's, sure. you know, yeah. doing what you can. And also, I think the way we look on business at businesses nowadays is not only seeing the product, but like what philosophy does uh, the company or the entity communicate as a whole? Like, what are their companies does it affiliate itself with like where the it's, it's often part of an ecosystem which we want to also be able to relate to as customers absolutely and that's where i see the brand as being so important because i think if you try to if you try to differentiate on product you've really only got two choices i suppose you've got three you can be the most expensive you can be the cheapest or you can be the absolute best mm. and all of these are pretty unsustainable because who's going to define the absolute best you know, on, on what basis, how. The cheapest, well, it's a pretty dangerous position. The most expensive, again, it's, there aren't very many absolutes that you can position on in terms of literally what you've got. Mm. It really has to be, it's that song, you know, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. It's, it's how, you're, um, how you deliver that thing. That is going to be the differentiation. That's why people are going to choose you. You know, I often think of the example of, um, of Xero and QuickBooks, you know, because they're, they're both accounting softwares. They're pretty much, in, as far as I know, I'm no expert, but I don't really see there's much difference in what you can do with the two. There's not a huge difference in pricing. But one of them looks very accountancy-ish, and the other one looks very kind of entrepreneurial-ish. Mm -hmm. And basically, you align yourself, really, based on how it feels, I think, to a large extent. You know, it's uh, how do you see yourself? You know, I, I, accountancy is absolutely a horror for me, so I go with zero because they say that I don't need to think about accountancy at all. Amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there's, again, a lot of powers of if not the same in academia, because there's not one researcher who is being successful on his or her own terms. There's not only a, a league of preceding research that's for that, yeah, that has happened before, which the research is being based on, but also colleagues, students, technicians, like, yeah, like a whole, again, league of personnel that contributes to the success of a research project. And that's usually embedded in an infrastructure with the institution where the research is taking place, provided also by manufacturers who provide the equipment for the research experimentation to be successful <laughs> because they hopefully function to a yeah, much enough degree. Um, so there's, yeah, again, there's, there's and then also the question is like, when it comes to open science, we talk about a range of um, principles and, and pillars within open science, which also includes open hardware and software. So the tools that we use as researchers to come up with the results and not only the conceptualization and the access to knowledge and access to contribution to knowledge. Um, so it's really holistic, um, similar to the entrepreneurial and business world. So there, there aren't so many differences, really. <laughs> it's just a different language, a different terminology. And often there's also bridges in between the entrepreneurial and the research world, especially when it comes to applied research, but also with basic research where I have my roots in. I did a PhD in evolution and development biology, where I always prided myself, our basic researchers often say, well, we don't know what we, what the purpose, well, the purpose is to acquire knowledge and to learn what nature provides. And that's 
beautiful and exciting enough, but also basic research often enough leads towards applied research and then implementation on societies. We just don't have that in the picture from the from the start of, from the from the get go. Um, I would like to, unless you want to share share any other comments on on what we've talked about henceforth. No, that's great. Thank you. It's good. I would like for us to shift a little bit because now um, you've moved from England um, to France, probably with other countries in between, but um, and that's you, you can share or not, um, totally up to you, but that's how life happens. Um, where I would like to draw the conversation towards is how does the French language come into your profession or like you, you shared before that as much as you're influent in French, you abstain from, from, from kind of training or coaching in French just because, and this is what I would like to hear from you. Sure, of course, of course. So um, just, so yes, I live in France now and yes, I'm Anglophone and my French is perfectly functional you know I can I can do everything that I need to do I can have conversations you know, I can uh, I can live in French that's fine but my work I suppose and, and even so there's, there's a bit of a distinction I'll make that in a minute but a lot of what I do is really helping people to express what they do and why they do it in a way that feels perfectly right and so to understand the right words the right tone the right character to express the thing that they that really resonates with them that feels yes that's right that's me those that's exactly how I feel and as a non-native French speaker I don't believe I have nor probably will ever have that degree of facility in, in the French language to really capture that absolutely correctly but the the bigger thing and so yeah, I do work with some French businesses or with businesses that have French clients but typically I work with with businesses that have anglophone clients as well because the thing that really strikes me living in France is there are significant cultural differences. I mean, there are significant similarities, of course. You know, we can all get along, we can all be friends, we can share interests, all sorts of things. But the general approach to communication, the expectation of a relationship you might have with a brand, the, the whole cultural background of how it is to have grown up in a different country, it's just not the same. You know, to have that depth of empathy and understanding of what is your customer experiencing? What are they living through right now? You know, by all means, I, would, I could happily coach a French business owner to do the right analysis, to think about it in the correct way, to put together those three elements, you know, what do I want? What do my customers want? What are, my, um, what are the competitors or comparators up to? But I don't inherently have that essence of how it feels in a different culture. And so that is, that's something that I'm really, really conscious of, that the way that, marketing works the way that communications work the way that brands work is not the same internationally that's um and, and so you know certainly one experience i had was uh, working for a business that was kind of bilingual across french and english and it was originally french and so a lot of the marketing was french translated to english and you know it was translated perfectly correctly but the concepts just didn't make sense i mean they just they were not things that you could really say they were close but they were not. And I'm conscious if I were to do it the other way around, I'm very likely to have exactly the same problem happen. Absolutely. And like we've had a few discussions on the show um, also with, um, for example, um, Avi Steinman, who runs a, a firm that facilitates editorial processes, including translation explicitly. Because, yeah, what you just said, like you can, of course, translate facts and workflows and processes from one language to the other, but the researchers are still human beings and the way um, knowledge is being communicated in writing as well is embedded in phrases that are native to the language of the narrator. And then translate, which also then care, like I think I'm getting better in understanding of capitalizing and and naming what I'm like the the tension that I feel is there when 
yeah, researchers have to translate their research into English in, in most cases. Um, okay, now I lost my train of thought, but basically, um, what I was trying to say is there's there's a lack of no, there's a loss of of information and information being and in how the knowledge sharing is being embedded into phrases that are native to the respective language and then being translated into another language or English in particular, as you said, just doesn't make sense. And then the editors or whoever is there to um yeah, to, to basically iron out the, or to, to make the English better is then tasked with having to understand what the authors were meant to say. And that's yeah. often not possible, like, because there's just too many gaps in between. I, my okay, aunt, of what, no, my, one of my aunts is a translator from Russian to German for uh, prose, so not scholarly works, but um, and from her, I know I just know that you know these like how lyric and and prose is often put into words carries so much cultural context and understanding and upbringing and being familiar with phrases and and terminology in a particular even within a country particular regions, um, which makes it like a huge task for a translator to to come yes. yeah to to be able to even comprehend themselves let alone then to translate into the other language i think it's right there's a loss of tone and nuance or there's a, a risk of the loss of tone and nuance mm. or a changing of the tone you know that's absolutely possible i often think because my academic background as i say is in english literature and a lot of my uh, focus was on studying the poetry of Seamus Heaney, who did um, a translation of Beowulf, a very, a very fantastic um, translation of this of Old Norse legend. And he really brings tone to it, which is fascinating because it completely influences your reading of the story. Mm. But to what extent is that translation, well, I mean, to a large extent, that translation is a work of art in itself. To what extent is it a representation of the original? Well, I don't know because I don't read um, old Norse or whatever, you know, but it, it's certainly it's a fantastic piece of work. It's an interpretation. It's not a it's not a copy. It's not something that you could do with Google Translate or Deepold. You know, it's a it's a work. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I think that's exactly where it comes down to. Also, for scholarly works being translated, it's always an interpretation only, nothing more and nothing less as well, because that's quite a yeah, quite an achievement in itself. Same with peer review when it comes to quality assessment, or that's one way to look at peer review, but really collegial um, feedback on uh, research funding is just that other researchers' interpretation of how they see their colleagues' work and what advice they might give to make it more coherent or to rectify whatever they see as mistakes in the project design. Um, so again, it's just about interpretation. Same for the researcher. Um, it's just about the means that we have as equipment and the knowledge that we bring to the table and experience from what we already know about the subject. We then come with our own way to interpret what we see as results and embed it into what we've already known and what other colleagues might think and, and say about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important for researchers to keep in mind where society expects us to provide facts. Mm -hmm. But if, if we now kind of summarize what we've just said, there's no, no such thing as facts. There's always a, a level of interpretation. And we can, like, I believe we can only get so close to actual facts with the means mm -hmm. that we have to observe nature or whatever research. Mm -hmm objects and subjects, but um, but to keep the humbleness or to keep the idea of, or to, to leave room for other people's interpretation. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering, are, do you use now in retrospect the periods in the business world when it comes to providing services? And maybe this is a bit too meta <laughs> for a conversation topic, but I just find it, really interesting like if we look at the parallels between academia and and the business world 
um, as much as businesses are, are also there to fill gaps, to solve problems, to serve society, I think the approach is really similar. It's just a different culture where the work is being done. Yep, yep. I think the analogy that you just made there is a it's a quite perfect expression of the role of brand in communications, to be honest, because you know there is the fact, there is the thing that is being delivered. And then how it is understood that the job of the brand is to try and bridge the gap as closely as possible between what the thing actually is and what it feels like to, to you, the, uh, the provider of the thing, and effectively to try and ensure that everybody out there, when they see it, is going to come as close as possible to understanding the thing that you hoped that they would understand, rather than just it, it, the more vague or the looser the brand, the more chance there is of each of a dozen of people are going to come up with a different interpretation of what actually it is and what it's all about. And so the purpose of the brand in being really focused mm -hmm. is to try and put everything in place, visually, verbally, um, in terms of character in essence, so that you do the best possible job you can to make sure that it's being received in the same way, wherever it turns up. And of course, you know, yes, it's always going to be an act of interpretation, of course it is. But the purpose of the brand is to try and guide that interpretation yeah. in order that it it's consistent mm -hmm. in order that it and that it's relevant so that it resonates with the right people and you know shows the people who perhaps were were not your ideal audience that actually their, their perfect option is perhaps a different one exactly and i think this like very much so is also why i invited you to this podcast because i think what we're trying to achieve with whatever you call science communication or marketing or you give it whatever term you want um listener um but by following proven techniques and strategies that were established over decades in the business world are well applied also for research purposes or in, in academia and often lacking and or you know can there's there's room for for better coaching in how researchers can and research departments can position themselves and their research projects to analyze ex exactly according to the three elements you mentioned in the beginning um to do a proper stakeholder analysis to understand what the purpose um of the research project as a whole is to get every participant or researchers who cooperate on the project, everybody's buy-in. So this is what we all believe in and where we want to collect the results and then contribute yeah. Um, yeah. to the best of our capacities to make this a success to serve whatever they've identified yeah. they want to serve for. Yes, it gives people something to get on board with, whether it's your internal stakeholders or your external stakeholders. Mm. the the best way to assure the success of your project you know that it will obtain you know the, the best I don't know, the best collaborations the best partners the best funding is to be able to communicate it in a way that's clear and energizing you know that shows people that if they participate in this they'll be participating in something worth believing in mm -hmm. I guess is um is the key and so it can be easy to kind of dismiss the idea of marketing or communications as being all about vanity and shouting out there in the sun I'm just in the middle of writing about a bit today actually that in fact in fact the most useful mindset shift to make on this is that you are helping people you know you're helping people to find the thing they want to engage with and so you're helping your mm. uh, your stakeholders your collaborators to understand or, or to believe in the purpose of what they're doing you know everybody wants to work on something that's purposeful and you're helping your potential, know, your potential funders, your potential, I don't know, your, your external stakeholders to understand, again, that this is a choice that, that, that they can really feel good about, you know, that they can get enthusiastic about. Mm. And without the knowledge, without the proper understanding of what you were trying to achieve with the thing, and what the purpose of the thing is, mm. th they have no basis to make that decision. Sure. And that also brings a lot of joy back to the table for everybody to partake in and and then intrinsic motivation to get out of bed for everyone <laughs> out of the project sure. every morning um, sure. day of the week wow okay so i think i think that's a great closing remark um having heard that from you um 
thank you so much for for joining us today and i'm sure there's more well obviously okay let's let's end this with the remark we just made but also how people can find you we will place the your website your your communication channels in the show notes and the affiliated blog post to this episode um what are, are there any upcoming programs where people can sign up or any access point would you be willing to also work with research departments in the first place would this be interesting absolutely, absolutely. i'd be delighted to help anybody who wants to get clearer about their about what actually they want to communicate in order to make a bigger difference i'd be delighted to support people with that kind of work mm. um so the best way at the moment um i work a lot with people on a kind of one-to-one -one basis. Uh, starting from January, I will also have a kind of guided program in order that you can find your own clarity through a, a six-step process. And so if that's something that interests you, then by all means do get in touch. And on my website, there is the opportunity to do a, um, a quiz, a brand quiz, where you answer 10 questions and it, it helps you identify the first three steps that you need to take to find greater clarity. That is very much designed with a business setting in mind, but as I think about it now, it is equally applicable and the terminology may not apply, but the concept certainly would apply to an academic setting. And so by all means, if that's something you'd like to see, your first three action points to take, then please do fill it in and I will send you back uh, a set of recommendations free. There you go. But thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, Great. same here. Thank you so much. And please, probably see you soon again here or in another room and um, <laughs> thanks to